Hi everyone, it's week eight. I'll be going over Rewilding Culture, YouTube as a K-pop interlocutor by Kente Ono and Jungmin Kwan. To be upfront, I'm not a diehard K-pop fan yet, but I do love the K-pop songs I've listened to over the years, and I find this topic really fascinating because it's a real life example of globalization's non-one-wayedness. What you can expect in this lecture is first some background information provided by Ono and Kwan, a summary of the first and second Korean waves, a list of reasons YouTube and K-pop work so well together, and finally, three takeaways related to globalization and other concepts from this class. In the first few pages of the reading, Ono and Kwan set the stage with some key points I highlight here. The first is a definition of worlding, which they define by referencing three women's texts and a critique of imperialism. Spivak says, worlding is an imperial process of implicitly reinscribing imperial culture into third world contexts in order to legitimize imperial dominance, including colonial dependence and unequal trade and consumption practices that of course benefit and privilege the imperial power. If that's worlding, then unworlding can be understood as the colonizing nation being removed from cultural dominance and reworlding can be understood as the colonized nation taking control of the process and recentering its own culture. The second point asserts Korea as a nation that has been colonized, which is significant because we wouldn't be having this conversation about worlding otherwise. So we have this historical understanding of Korea as having been colonized by Japan and the US to contextualize the popularity of K-pop in both of those nations. The last point is that K-pop music has multiple influences from other nations, countries whose music has been influenced by other countries, of course. This idea of hybridity does not mean K-pop is any less Korean or that Korea shouldn't get credit for K-pop. Now let's get into the first Korean wave. The first wave describes a period during the late 1990s when several Korean dramas and singer groups gained popularity around Asia. The reading specifies China and Japan as two countries with solid audiences. While their success was notable, any further growth was underestimated. The critic quoted in the reading suggested that the first Korean wave was a repackaging of US products, only to be received well in East Asia. Korean entertainment companies wanted to break out of East Asia and onto the global stage, and they kind of hit the ground running, which is what spurred the second Korean wave. These are the four main ways that entertainment companies such as SM Entertainment, JYP, and YG Entertainment ensured global recognition for musical groups during the second Korean wave. First, they began including foreign language learning in their star training in addition to singing and dancing so that their stars could be multilingual in English, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean to connect with a wider audience. Then there's strategic marketing with Korean albums and artists being promoted and marketed by different experts for each different country. Next, they, collaborate, <laughs> Next, they collaborated with successful international composers and producers, such as Will I Am in the US. This reminded me of the collaborations between Lady Gaga and Blackpink on Sour Candy, Boy, uh, Boy With Love by BTS and Halsey, and most recently, BTS and Megan The Stallion on Butter, which has 4.5 million likes on YouTube. It's a good song. I'm a big fan of Megan, so I put these photos here. Finally, YouTube holds a big part in K-pop's global circulation. The reading talks about these four points. The visuality of music. Because on YouTube you're watching a video, it works great that so much effort is put into visuals in K-pop, like choreography and costume. Transnational technology. As someone born in the year 2000, it's hard to wrap my head around what makes YouTube special because I'll watch cooking videos and all sorts of things from all over the world all the time. But in comparison to tuning into your local radio station or watching what's offered on your cable TV, that's a really big deal and definitely made K-pop more accessible to lots of people. Participatory culture. YouTube's platform encourages interaction, whether it's fan to fan or fan to K-pop singer. You're able to comment, upload dance covers, make a fan cam on iMovie, and then upload that. 
And then minimal barriers and limitations. Ono and Kwan write that YouTube significantly limits various barriers, barriers to consuming music through portability, accessibility, and repeatability. I'm thinking about how you can look up any song and listen to it as many times as you want. And if anything, all you have to do is watch an advertisement. So K-pop and YouTube work magnificently together. What's the point? Let's get into these three takeaways. The cultural flow between the imperial powers and post-colonial subjects is nuanced, multi-directional, and includes open interpretation, as referenced in Tomlinson's reading. K-pop's relationship to YouTube is an example of Apaturai's idea of global cultural flow and differences and disjunctures between mediascapes, technoscapes, financescapes, idioscapes, and ethnoscapes. And lastly, YouTube, while started in the US, benefits and relies on the popularity of K-pop to bring traffic to its platform. Simultaneously, it provides tools for Korea to reworld the first world. Thanks for watching. Good luck on your quiz. This is a reference list of all the photos that I used. Bye.